Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this panel discussion on fleet management across APEC. APEC is in many respects the most complex for fleet region to manage. The countries are quite diverse with many differences in business culture, in supplier offering, and also in the attitude towards vehicle fleet and mobility management. And then there are the fast developing megacities across Asia Pacific, and they have a particular challenge. Welcome to the panel discussion, Mastering Fleet and Mobility Expectations Across Asia Pacific. To understand if you can master those expectations, we have invited four experts. May I welcome Nget Yit Ming, Regional Procurement Manager, Car Fleet Asia, Oceania and Africa at Nestle. Ming, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. The second expert is Mace Hartley, Executive Director of the Australia Asian Fleet Management Association, better known as AFMA. Mace, welcome to the panel. Yeah, good day, Stephen. Thanks uh, for allowing me to uh, join you. Thank you very much for being with us. And finally, um, we have as an expert also Scott Torp. And Scott Torp is the general manager, sales and marketing at Oryx Australia. Scott, welcome in the panel. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And then you see, of course, a fourth expert here on the screen, and that is the co-moderator of this session, Eve Helven, who is our global fleet APEC expert. Good morning to you, Eve. Hello, Stephen. Good to be with you today. Thank you very much, guys. Um, gentlemen, welcome to the expert panel discussion. The first question I have for Ming. Ming, um, what are the fleet management obstacles in APEC and how can you and other fleet managers overcome them? Okay. Uh, thanks again, Stephen, for having me. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Fleet APEC essentially is um, quite different in terms of the obstacles. So I'll just go through really quickly. Um, you've got different uh, maturity levels in terms of the leasing services that offer, which um, people are more commonly familiar to in Europe. And it's also from market to market, it's actually quite different. Uh, the other obstacle in APEC as well, which I've noticed is uh, from a transparency transparency point of view. So for example, uh, when you do receive quotations, uh, you would actually find it's quite common that they would just give you, um, let's say, for example, 100 US dollars a month, and that's it. They will not have any breakdown in terms of um, how much certain things cost, like maintenance, insurance, and so on. So it's just, it's very close in that um, aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is usually some resistance in terms of uh, looking at global templates uh, and contracts. Uh, the other couple of other quick things as well to notice as well is um, uh, from a, a communication point of view, it is also quite common that language barriers can be an issue and there's a lot of interpretation or misinterpretation in terms of what is being discussed. Um, some other things which I've noticed in, in this role is that from a supplier presence as well, it's quite limited in, in terms of the uh, global or regional presence. So mm -hmm. for example, if you would like to say, I would like to have one supplier for the whole of APAC, uh, you would pretty much come to a conclusion quite quick that that's not actually possible, uh, not like in, in Europe or in the Americas. <laughs> and okay. I just uh, guess other things uh, very quickly is that um, from a single point of contact, it's also not so easy as a result of that. Uh, and you also have local uh, market conditions which you need to worry about. Um, how many vehicles do you manage and across APEC? In terms of, uh, for Nestle itself, uh, we're just over about 5,000 vehicles. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, just to give you an idea, globally, we have about uh, 23,000 vehicles. So it's, okay. it's 5,000 in APEC. Okay, good. Um, I would like to continue with Mace. Uh, Mace, um, Ming was mentioning a few obstacles that he already sees as a fleet manager across APEC. The question is, of course, how to overcome those challenges, those obstacles. What would be your advice to global fleet managers that have a responsibility across APEC? Well, I think we go back to that old saying from, uh, from any sort of strategy, think globally, 
and then act locally or regionally. And, and that's very much the case when you're in Asia Pacific. The fact is that we talk about those mega cities and popular um, densities, very different to going into Malaysia and even Malaysia in itself has city regions and then regional regions. And there's a whole range of issues in amongst that. So I think you need to build this global view and then dial it back to see what's possible based on the, uh, the area you're trying to respond to. And the most biggest difference I see is the equipment safety, vehicle safety is massively different across uh, all of APAC. And in fact, you're seeing manufacturers take out safety specifications that would be day to day in Europe or Australia or New Zealand, but uh, throughout Asia, they take them out. Okay, very good. Eve, um, I think that you have a follow-up question. Yeah, I have a question for Scott and Ming already touched this topic, um, Scott. Um, Ming was saying, well, there's, there's a risk of misinterpretation due to language issues, but if we take it a little bit wider, it's not just language, it's also cultural differences. There are differences, different ways of doing business right across APEC. Now, Oryx is a pan-Asian provider. Um, you're present in a lot of the Asian countries, especially the countries where you have fleets, of course. Um, what is what is your experience in overcoming those cultural differences? And what could you recommend to, um, let's say, fleet managers who are not well informed about Asia? I think that <clears throat> it's an interesting question, Eves. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is people do come in with a mindset of what I do in the US or what I do in Europe, I will try to replicate in the Asia PAC uh, region. So I think the first thing I'd say is, and, and Mace touched on it, you've really got to take a, a, a step back and seek to understand what's happening in your business in those respective countries. So it's simple questions like, what assets do I have? What manufacturers do I use? Um, you know, where do I have it and why do I have it? And then from there, I think you really need to take some time to engage with your local partners, being your internal staff, to understand why things happen in a certain way in those countries. And once you've actually got some of that information, you can then sort of take some time to understand whether there's any local or regional issues that really intersect with one of your, your own global policies. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it allows you to achieve some credibility with the, the local stakeholders. And then you can develop, it's easier to develop wind themes with your, your local stakeholders. So you can really move your, um, I guess your global policy or the maturity of your global policy in that region forward. And I think that's the, the, the biggest piece of the puzzle is taking the time to understand mm -hmm. and both educating and learning at the same time. So, mm -hmm. you know, not to walk into there to change everything on day one, but seek to learn and then educate why things are different in, in other countries as well. So yeah. that'd be my biggest piece of advice. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And Ming, maybe a quick follow-up question for you. The way Scott explains is that, you know, engagement is, is really important, is essential, actually, in working with, uh, with Asian countries. Does it mean that it's very difficult to have top-down decision-making? Is it difficult for you to go out to one of your Asian countries and just tell them what they need to do? Do you need to go through that engagement process each and every time? Yeah, I think it really depends on the company's uh, direction. Um, certainly, I can I can say for for Nestle, it's more of a collaborative approach, and and I think if I'm not mistaken, most companies follow this. So, you, it's not like hey, you know, I'm going to come into your to to your market and say um, BMW for everybody or Toyota for everybody. It, it's really like you said, understanding what the the market requirements are and it's more of a collaboration so maybe just to quickly touch on that uh, there is a lot of internal alignment which happens and i think it's going to be the same not just for nestle but for other companies you have to get people who are in hr who control the policy line uh, finance which is obviously the cost uh, facility management which is operations and also the local procurement team over there to to get your project um, 
uh, ongoing. And, and the key thing to remember over here is that early involvement of all these stakeholders is, is very key to ensure that it's success because you, you can't just sit in, I guess, um, in regional or in an ivory tower, as some people say, and say, you know, you need to follow this. You, you have to work together with uh, the full team to make it happen. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to continue with Mace. Mace, um, you are representing uh, AFMA. It's a fleet management association. Uh, you are in contact with many vehicle fleet managers across the region. What do you think is the most common mistake that the uh, fleet managers make when they want to include APEC into a global strategy? And secondly, what are the countries in the region where you say those are probably the easiest one to include in a global strategy? Yeah, that's a bit interesting, that question. What's the easiest to include? Um, Singapore is certainly much easier than Malaysia, for instance, or Vietnam. I think when we go back to your first question, and, and the most common mistake is uh, having that global strategy and then not dialing it back to what you can actually do locally. And sometimes it's simple as refining your KPIs. And uh, I think Ming touched on earlier, used the word maturity. And that's really where we are. So a range of APAC countries, labor is extremely cheap. The cars are sometimes expensive, their benefit. You know, there's, there's a lot to change when it comes down to mobility and safety. And just the understand, safety is not that important in some countries. Life, unfortunately, is cheaper in some countries than it is in others. Okay. Uh, Scott, what in your opinion, based on also the reactions you have within Oryx from regional and global customers, are the main challenges that they are confronted with and the, and the most challenging countries? Yeah, so I think it's a blend of what Mace and Ming have already said. So um, I think there's a lot of um, miscommunication that happens um, from parent companies moving into the, into the region and just getting that basic understanding of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it in those particular countries. I mean, on the maturity curve, um, I know you've had guest speakers in the past, Stephen, that have spoken about countries like Australia and New Zealand are as mature as, as any of the countries in Europe and our products are very similar. Um, you know, closely behind that are countries like Japan and India. But at the other end of the spectrum, you do have the emerging countries. You've got the, the likes of Cambodia, you've got the likes of, you know, Laos, um, Vietnam. And Vietnam's a, a, a country these days that when we're talking to um, global companies, Vietnam's always on people's radars. And mm -hmm. You know, there aren't a lot of, um, I'll say, global providers that um, offer um, representation in those markets. So you do need to understand who are my local providers that can provide the same level of service and how do I aggregate that information mm -hmm. to give me the transparency across the region. Okay, thank you. Eve, uh, let's continue with powertrains and electrification. Yeah, and I would like to ask this question to Ming for, for a few specific reasons. One, sustainability being um, a hot topic at, uh, at Nestle, and also I know that, that Ming specifically has been, uh, has been taking some initiatives in APEC. So Ming, what's your view on you know, the speed of electrification in APEC and sustainability as a topic? Sure. So I, I guess I'll cover the sustainability question first. Um, definitely, I think uh, not just with APEC, but across the world uh, with a lot of the big uh, companies, there's a lot of talk about sustainability. It's, it's uh, I guess, probably you can say the flavor of the month at the moment. It's um, in everybody's minds. Uh, specifically for, for APEC and um, when you talk about uh, uh, this, this sustainability. Um, I guess there's a couple of parts to it. So green fleet, this is one term which is used a lot. So you've got your hybrid vehicles, you've got your plug-in hybrid, you've got your electric, you've got your biofuels. Certainly it is picking up in Asia Pacific, but it's not at the same level as Europe. Uh, there are limited options available over here and we have seen that they are quite expensive. Um, and the other challenges is infrastructure, you know, in terms of the charging sites, uh, there is range anxiety as well. 
Um, but definitely it is picking up here. And I can at least tell you um, from, from a Nestle side of it, this is at the forefront of uh, every tender we run. We need to make sure that the vehicles are, um, are sustainable, clean, and we try our best to get it. Um, and just interestingly enough, today, as I read in Malaysia specifically, you can see governments are definitely taking a more proactive approach. So in Malaysia, they just announced that um, you can register your interest for uh, Volvo XC40, which is a 100% electric vehicle. So definitely it's, it's coming to the Asia Pacific and we, we cannot mm -hmm. ignore it. This, this is the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ming. And I'm going to throw it over to you, Mace, because um, Australia is a bit of, a, of an odd case, right? Because we would expect Australia to be ahead of the curve when it comes to sustainability, electrification. But is that is that the reality? The reality is we're at the, the wrong end of that curve. Um, mm -hmm. Federally, we have a, a lack of policy for over a decade, which continues to flag us. Uh, however, at a state level, um, we've seen uh, great inroads, although we, we do have three states looking to put a road user charge uh, tax in on EVs. Uh, the perception is that that probably is likely to happen, um, but the reality is they'll provide some other incentive to actually help you acquire a vehicle sooner than later. The fact is we're all going to move to a road user charge based system at some point. No federal government want to embrace it. It's very interesting that a state level, they're taking the opportunity to actually take control of a, a federal based tax and, and, and uh, I guess trial it out on a very small cohort of people, learn from the errors, learn from the mistakes and, and see where it goes. So uh, AFM has made a number of submissions to various state governments um, over the last couple of weeks and months and we'll see where we get to. It's a very interesting topic. Our renewables continues to grow. It's mm -hmm. uh, everyone's on board except uh, the federal government. Okay, thank you. I uh, would like to continue with Scott and we move from electrification to mobility. Um, Scott, what about the future of the company car in the context of new mobility and smart mobility? How do you see new mobility emerge across APEC? So I actually think there is a clear crossover between the sustainability discussion and mobility. They're intrinsically linked. Um, so I think the first thing I, was, I would always challenge somebody is understanding what net zero means for them. And for some people, it will be that transition from ICE through to EV, maybe another alternative fuel down the, the path. But you know, smart mobility um, is also finding its place in, in the fleet market. And you know, a lot of people have linked the acceleration of, of smart mobility or mobility or use of company cars to COVID. Um, I would actually argue that um, mobility or the foundations of mobility were well established pre-COVID. And now what businesses are organically doing is challenging their traditional models. And, you know, those traditional models are going to be tested and they will range from moving away from traditional ownership or long-term leasing models to shorter term leasing models so I can cater for the flex in my business as my business shifts and you know the, um, I guess my customer demands shift up and down, I can flex my fleet with that. But I think it's also just watching the space of whether styles of products like pay per use mm -hmm. or transport as a service start to become more of the norm. And you, know, you only have to look to countries like Europe um, or even in the US where we've had conversations with some of our global customers where their staff are pushing for transport as a service or an allowance to allow them to consume transport as they need it. And you know, from a staff's perspective, they're saying it makes me more productive. I don't have to drive around mega cities trying to find parking stations. If I find a parking station, I'm not paying you know, $80 in Sydney to park for an hour or an hour and a half. Um, so I do think the whole concept of how vehicles are used, but also the concept of moving away from vehicles themselves to other forms of transport um, in mega cities and mature countries is going to be a thing that we will have to adapt to as we move forward. 
Okay. Gentlemen, we need to end this expert panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your ideas and your insights. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from our experts. Uh, it is possible to master fleet and mobility expectations across APAC, but you need to have a very good and defined strategy and make sure that also the solutions across APAC that sometimes are are different in between countries that you select the right ones for your strategy. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.